someone last year, I think, found the uh, original note of introduction that I sent to uh, one of the uh, internet discussion lists and economic list. And it was dated, I believe it was uh, January 1996. So they're trace that's the the date that I uh, t attempted to introduce what has later become MMT to the academic community. Before, before that, it had just been in the uh, financial community. Those were the days of uh, Ross Perot and the whole uh, deficit mania wave that was happening back then about how the government was going broke. And I just you know, wanted to live in a world where you know, we weren't constrained by that kind of thinking and, and set out to promote proper understanding that would uh, open up policy options that weren't uh, even under consideration. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron-only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Hello, welcome to the second International European MMT Conference. My name is Dirk Inz and I'm the speaker of the board for Pufendorf Society for Political Economy, who is organizing this. So again, welcome to the MMT Conference in these kind of troubled times. So I do stand here with conflicting emotions. I'm, I'm very sad that many people have died during the ongoing pandemic. In terms of economic policy, some nations have coped rather well, whereas others did not. Debts and deficits are now discussed on an almost daily basis, and so is inflation. For MMT, the last two years mean some pretty big steps forward. It is now clear to all that a government spending its own currency cannot run out of money. In November 2020, ECB President Christine Lagarde said at a press conference, and now I quote, as the sole issuer of euro-denominated central bank money, the euro system, which is the ECB and the national central banks, will always be able to generate additional liquidity as needed. So by the definition, it will neither go bankrupt nor run out of money. There you have it. Money can be created at no cost without any limit. This means that we have to talk about the political rules that regulate access to money. The question, how do we pay for that, can easily be solved by changing the laws regulating the monetary system. In the Eurozone, this happened in March 2020. The escape clause um, of the Stability and Growth Pact was deactivated, so that so-called excessive deficits, so budget deficits of the governments above 3% of GDP, would not be punished anymore. At around the same time, the European Central Bank, the ECB, created its Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, so-called PEP, designed to ensure liquidity and solvency for all national governments, including that of Greece. On the other side of the Atlantic, House Budget Committee Chair Representative John Yamas from, uh, I think it was Kentucky, said on C-SPAN, when asked how the American government can afford all that spending, I quote again, we can afford it because we determine how much money is in the system at the federal level. The federal government is not like any other user of currency, not like any household, any business, any state or local government. We issue our own currency and we can spend enough to meet the needs of the American people, 
The only constraint being that we do have to worry about inflation from that spending. Well, that's clearly MMT. Well, almost. The other constraint is that people will at some point stop selling to the US government because they already sold everything they wanted to sell at the existing or ongoing prices. Then Yamos is correct. The government might increase prices to induce people to sell more. So inflation really is a worry. Anyway, it is telling that the high ranking official from the US government now frames his ideas about debt and deficits in terms of MMT. In the 2020s, it seems, MMT is needed to justify economic policy in the post-pandemic world, which, by the way, is the topic of our conference. Who is we then? The conference is organized by a small NGO based in Berlin, Germany, and named after Samuel Pufendorf, a philosopher and legal scholar. Pufendorf wrote, and now this is a direct quote, it is true that God allowed men to turn the earth, its products and its creatures to his own use and convenience, that is, he gave men indefinite right to them, yet the manner, intensity and extent of this power were left to the judgment and disposition of men, whether in other words they would confine it within certain limits or within none at all, and whether they wanted every man to have a right to everything or only to a certain and fixed part of things, or to be assigned his definite, definitive portion with which he should rest content and claim no right to anything else. So it is up to us to organize our societies. We can, through democratic institutions, determine how we use the resources that we have and if we want to reduce them. Economic policymaking today is just what this looks like in the 21st century. The quote that I just read to you is from 1672 and more than or almost 350 years old. So we are standing on Pufendorf's shoulders here. We're not scholars trying to somehow work with the Pufendorf uh, books, but it's the ideas that somehow society can determine its own fate that uh, attracted us to Pufendorf. So we as a Pufendorf society want to educate the public about how money and finance work. This is why we embrace MMT. It allows us to understand the world around us, making sense of debts and deficits, taxation and government spending, inflation and employment, and so much more. It is a lens that allows us to see the world from different perspective, a Copernican revolution rather than the renovation of something that used to be out of sight. So today we have four keynotes that deal with money. Tomorrow we will have four panels on unions and demand policy, inequality, the Green New Deal, and then political economy of fiscal policy. And on Wednesday, there will be presentations by academics. All of this will happen online. This is sad because we would have liked to meet you all at the JFK Institute at Free University Berlin this year, which was the venue that we chose. Having just spent almost a whole week at the first MMT summer school at Poznan in Poland, I know what we will miss, and it is hard for me to accept it. As Pufendorf very well understood, human beings are sociable, which in German means gesellig. As human beings, we thrive when being in social surroundings that support us, when we are part of communities that care. We will direct all our efforts in 2022 to make this conference a real world experience again. For now, I hope that you stay with us anyway and enjoy the conference that we have put together. So I would like to thank Daniel von Ahlen, Marcel Dimke, Maurice Höfken, Erik Jochen, and Michael Petz for their help in making this happen. I also thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for their financial uh, support. And now we will move forward to our first keynote, which is actually an interview with Warren Mosler, whose interest in reserve accounting has probably been the unresistible force that turned into MMT. Warren has been working in finance for many decades. He also worked as an engineer, creating very effective racing cars and a passenger ferry. So Warren, how are you? Very good, thank you. Good, good to be here. And uh, good to see that MMT has taken on a life of its own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really did. So yeah, uh, I, I think um, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, MMT, some, something has uh, like turned 25 this year. So a quarter of century, it is old. Uh, in 1996, you already understood money and how reserve accounting works. So 
the central bank apparently just credited the accounts of the banks when the government spends, which is what you kind of discovered. So bond and tax revenues are not about financing, but rather take money out of circulation, stabilizing the interest rate when it comes to bonds and unemployment when it comes to tax revenues. You decided then to contact some academics using the internet. Is this how you first connected with Bill Mitchell and Randall Ray? Yes, it is. And someone last year, I think, found the uh, original uh, uh, note of introduction that I sent to uh, one of the uh, internet discussion lists and economic list. And it was dated, I believe it was uh, January 1996. So they're trace that's the, the date that I uh, t attempted to introduce what has later become MMT to the academic community. Before, before that, it had just been in the uh, financial community. I've been talking about it with myself, my associates, and uh, you know other other members of the financial sector for a, a number of years before that. And uh, soft currency economics had been uh, completed and self-published uh, maybe three three years earlier. Yeah, and, and why did you want the support of of the academics? What was your idea behind that? You know, those were the days of uh, Ross Perot and the whole uh, deficit mania wave that was happening back then about how the government was going broke and I just you know wanted to live in a world where you know we weren't constrained by that kind of thinking and, and set out to promote proper understanding that would uh, open up policy options that weren't uh, even under consideration yeah okay thanks um, well today of course MMT has evolved quite a lot and um, we have an MMT textbook uh, with more than 600 pages, um, which has been written by, by Ren, Bill Ray and by Bill Mitchell, um, with the help of another author whose name I just forgot. Uh, I think it was Martin Watt, I think, yeah. And there are also dozens of books and academic articles, hundreds of working papers at the Levy Institute, for example, alone. And US government officials, they use MMT to explain fiscal policy. Stephanie Kelton's The Deficit Miss is a New York Times bestseller. And the US today features high public debt and deficits. Um, and probably there is some need for more government spending because of the crisis, the pandemic. Uh, there's also a lot of inequality. There's high levels of unemployment. All of this needs to be addressed by economic policy. So um, does this explain then the tremendous success of MMT? Um, or is it a demand? So is it a demand side phenomenon? Or is it a supply side phenomenon? So, so once you get it, uh, there's just no way that you can go back and, and try uh, and go back to this kind of government running out of, of money myth. What do you think? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the big thing that MMT brought to the public was the idea that uh, of sequence, where we had all the congressmen, all the members of parliament thinking that the, they have to get the money first to be able to spend. If they don't get it, they can't spend it. So they have to tax it to be able to spend it or they have to borrow it to be able to spend it. And we've reversed that uh, uh, because we've recognized, what MMT recognizes first is that the dollars to pay taxes come only from the US government. The yen to pay taxes come only from the Japanese government. So the funds to pay taxes come from the government of issue and they come through its agent, which is the central bank. In the U.S., that's the Fed, uh, which is created by an agency of Congress created by the Federal Reserve Act. And they're the uh, bookkeeper for the currency. They're the scorekeeper for the currency. And so once you understand that the dollars to pay taxes come from the Federal Reserve, uh, then you've reversed the sequence. And now you realize that it's the economy that needs the government's money to be able to pay its taxes. It's not the government that needs the economy's money to be able to spend. It's, it's, these are publicly created dollars by the Federal Reserve, and the economy cannot pay its taxes uh, without those dollars. Now, th that doesn't mean that taxes are not absolutely critical. In fact, when you look at the actual sequence, which is what I call the MMT money story, which is also uh, a contribution, uh, Every school of thought has its own money story. Either it started with barter or it started with uh, some kind of exchange because it was more convenient and all kinds of things. But we jump right to the uh, to the explanation of today's currencies. You know whether it happened historically or not is not a particular concern. What we have is our states trying to uh, provision themselves. And what the, and the first thing you do when you want to provision yourselves in a monetary economy is you set 
in place tax liabilities. So, and for example, to uh, make it uh, keep the model elemental, I'll use a property tax. You put a tax on everybody's house. And, uh, and it's a tax on something they don't have, the US dollars. So you put a tax on everybody's house and the government is the source of the dollars to pay those taxes. Now, if you don't put a tax on everybody's house, no one's going to be looking or care about US dollars. So step one is the tax liability. This creates a population, causes the population to become sellers of their labor, sellers of goods and services in order to get the money to pay the tax. Okay, and people looking for uh, paid work who can't find it. Okay, and right now they can't find it, because, you know, at this point in the model because the government hasn't spent anything yet. All, they, all we've done is uh, uh, assume a tax liability. Okay, now we have a population that is unemployed. They're looking for paid work and can't find it. That's the definition of unemployment. And so what we see here is that the source of, um, you know, it, it's tax liabilities that create unemployment by design. Okay, and no other school of thought has uh, introduced that concept. So, so tax liabilities function to deliberately, you know, by design to create unemployment for the further purpose of the government then being able to hire those people. So the government then offers jobs, it hires people that it needs to provision itself, soldiers, public health workers, and that type of thing. Excuse me. And I got interrupted. It, it hires the, the people it needs, then it pays them, and then the tax is paid at the end of the chain. So the payment of taxes is not the uh, funding the government in the sense that the government is not collecting those taxes to get the money to spend. However, tax liabilities are enabling government to spend, and they are critical in driving the system. It's a tax-driven system. It's coercive, uh, and that, that's how it works. Yeah, thanks. That's, I think, a very nice way to put it. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's move on to the next topic. Um, yep. and discuss the U.S. economy. So, so consumer price inflation was 5.3% in July. And I wonder what your take is on that. So will inflation come down eventually or will inflation rates stay above the historical average? Okay, so now, you know, as, as an academic, you would not call, and I would not call a price increase inflation. You have to determine whether it's, uh, you know, inflation is a continuous increase of prices over time. And what we've had is, uh, so far, a one-time price increase due to the tariffs that the uh, U.S. put in place by the Trump administration and then doubled down by the Biden administration. So it's, we have, uh, you know, near universal support of tariffs, which I think is one of our horrible economic mistakes. Completely uh, chapter five in my 7DIF book for you who've read it. Anyway, and then we had the COVID situation, which put further... Uh, stress on the supply side of the economy. So due to these issues on the supply side, uh, we have had uh, price increases that were, I would say were not driven by, in this case, excess demand. Yes, we've had fiscal adjustments that have sustained demand, but if you look at actual consumption, it hasn't uh, it's shown the signs of uh, being at the point of driving up prices. So right now we've got these price increases caused by the supply side. And the question is whether this will become some kind of a continuous increase over time or whether prices will level off where they are now or whether they may even come back down a little bit. So, you know, looking at it myself, I think prices will level off where they are now and maybe increase from these levels at back to our old levels of 2% a year or something like that. Because the institutional structure that, uh, keeps prices in check and doesn't um, allow, th the way the Fed would say, it doesn't allow a relative value story to turn into an inflation story. But it does make uh, people worse off. So I'm not saying it's a good thing. But what I'm saying is we don't have what would be called inflation uh, from uh, excess demand. And the, the problem is, if you look at wages last year, went up at 4.5% last I checked, which is high. It's higher than they've grown. But it falls short of the consumer price level, which was up over 5%. And so we've had a uh, 
diminished ability to buy what's offered for sale. Normally, um, wages will increase faster than prices because there's, and um, which doesn't cause inflation because there are, there are productivity increase, increases associated with the economy every year. Uh, so for wages nominally to not keep up with the price level uh, certainly puts a strain on demand. Uh, also, we've got the fiscal impulse that we got from the uh, COVID related spending, which I would say never would have happened without uh, the knowledge of MMT because it was, you know, three, four trillion dollars without even a discussion of how they're going to pay for it. I, I just can imagine that happening two years ago and before that. Uh, but, you know, in, in any case, uh, that is not continuous. That's not going to happen uh, on a continuous basis. So the best we can, we just had the uh, uh, unemployment compensation from the federal government, which was a large part of it, expire uh, last week. And so we've had that reduction in fiscal uh, expense that, uh, and now uh, we're looking towards the uh, infrastructure package and it looks like that's not gonna happen. So it, it looks like we're backsliding now in terms of aggregate demand at the same time where uh, prices are going up. So I, I, you know, we're in a very dangerous place in the economy right now. And I, I don't think a continuous increase in prices is, is in the cards. Mm -hmm. And and what about the oil prices? If the oil price would go up some more, is it maybe possible to have a situation in which demand is, is slowing down and prices are still still growing? Is this possible? What do you think of that, about that? Yeah, so oil is at best a cartel and more, more likely just a plain Saudi monopoly. But I think that I, I was just reading uh, from an interview with the president of Luke Oil, the Russian company, and it looks like it's not just the Saudis anymore, but they're working with the Russians on setting price, it's, which is exactly what he said. And he said, and right now our target is $65 to $75 a barrel, and we believe that's the correct price for uh, the, the economy the way it is. They're probably worried about it getting too high, which would bring out exploration and uh, particularly in the U.S., and they certainly don't want it to go down because then they lose all their revenue. So they're trying to look at how high they can keep it before, uh, you know, that it starts uh, causing supply increases. And so the point is they're just setting the price. And in Saudi Arabia, it's just the oil minister and the king, and they can set it anywhere they want. If they have a bad night in London, they can come home and raise the price of oil. In 19 and 2007, they went all the way up to 150 something before they broke the markets. And, that was a very large, you know, uh, contrib significant contributing factor to the crash of 08. And we just don't know when they're going to do that. It's not about market forces. It's about uh, what these guys want to do. You know, they were born in their own private A380s flying around the world. <laughs> and it's hard to understand. You know, I, I don't have a handle on what motivates them to do anything from one day to the next. But they have full power to set the price anywhere they want at any time they want. And that's what we have to live with right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, what about the financial markets? So the Dow Jones index currently stands at about uh, 43,600. Yeah. And yeah. in March 2020, it stood at roughly half that number. So it doubled in a year and a half. What is your view on that development? So we've got some technical things happening in that market that I don't, I'm not close enough to and I don't. I haven't done the work on what what the actual effect on prices is, but it's, it's it's material and it's substantial. And that is we have passive investing now. So when someone gives their money to a manager to invest or the pension fund goes to invest, they can have analysts figuring out what, what each individual company is worth, or they can just put the money in an index fund or create their own portfolio that matches the indexes. And under the theory that over time, the index funds have done better than the average portfolio manager. So you might as well just give your money to put your money in an index fund or index your purchases to the S&P 500, for example. And it's fairly easy to do. You just know what those 500 stocks are and what. Uh, and if you had $500, you'd know how many dollars to put in each stock to uh, to ref to perform you know, roughly equivalent to that index. And that's called passive investing. And now you don't even have to do any analysis of any of the companies and you feel confident that you're going to 
beat the person or do at least as well as the person who's doing all this expensive analysis. Well, what that means is uh, right now that passive investing, last I saw, is over 60% of the stock market. So 60% of the holdings of people are done passively. Uh, you might have a, a, a personal retirement account and you'll check off a box that says, uh, oh, I want to this much in a S&P index fund or this much in a small cap index fund or something like that. So we have mostly passive investors. That leaves uh, very few people who are actually analyzing any of the prices. And uh, every, you know, every week when a pension fund does its investment, it simply buys whatever's in the S&P 500 or puts its money in an index fund and that fund manager buys the S&P 500. And those stocks all, uh, have that upward pressure on prices based purely on cash flows and not at all on analysis. And so we've driven the S&P up to levels where uh, certainly you question the valuations. Uh, even though interest rates are low, we can look at Japan for the last 30 years, the stocks just didn't run away forever. In European stocks where we've had low interest rates, they don't run away. But in the US, this is happening where they're just going up continuously uh, and the valuations that look overvalued but with people just blindly putting money into these funds uh and without any work there's not a lot to stop it you know apart from some kind of a, a major credit problem in w which case it would all go into reverse and then there's not a lot to stop it from going the other way we've seen this happen before we're different it's, it's a big fallacy of composition it happened back in the uh, crash of 87 with uh uh, it was called portfolio, uh, uh, what they call it, theory, <laughs> modern portfolio theory. I watched the Japanese stock market at night go from 20,000 to 5,000 in one trade. Okay, that, that was a big stock market that just dropped 75%. And then it went back to 10 or 15,000. And that's what happens when, uh, you, you know, you're in a crowded movie theater and somebody yells fire, goes for the door. So it, everything's good until it isn't. I, I don't know how far it's going to go. I haven't done any. I, you know, I'm not involved in the markets directly anymore and haven't been since really 1998 or 99 when I turned my funds over to my uh, partners. In fact, that was the end of 1997. I turned the funds over to my partners. So I'm, I'm the wrong guy to be asking about the stock market. <laughs> yeah, let's um, let's move then from from profit maximization to to public purpose. Uh, yeah. Looking forward, we, we need to transform our societies to ensure that global warming is stopped and that we can live within the planetary boundaries. So could you explain to us how we have to think about money and resources? Because here in Germany, many people say that any kind of socio-ecological transformation will be, will be costly in terms of money and debt also, but ultimately it's a story about resources, right? Yes, so whatever we wanna do, if we have the resources, we can use a monetary system to organize and get it done. But look, we have a larger problem. Uh, Last year with COVID, during the last year with COVID, the first week or so, we saw emissions drop something like 50% globally, okay? And we eliminated non-essentials and we had a 50% drop. So that's purely from conservation. And, you know, was there any discussion of, oh, that's interesting. You know, instead of all this talk about Green New Deal and what we're doing to curb emissions growth and maybe bring it down over 20 or 30 years. We just cut it in half by eliminating non-essentials. That's pretty good. Why don't we like, you know, have a restart from here, leave it here. And let's look about restarting the economy without uh, bringing back these non-essentials that are causing the uh, emissions issues. And there wasn't even a discussion. Okay. And now I look at gasoline consumption and everything else. And you know, congratulations, we've recovered. We're back to where we were before this. And now our emissions are back up to where we were. And oh yeah, now what are we going to do to bring them down? Okay, so how serious is anybody about actually doing this when we just had a 50% cut and just squandered it? And now we're talking about, you know, enormous reconstruction of all these economies, which can be done. And there's a real cost. We're going to be applying labor that could be curing cancer or coming up with cold fusion and other forms of energy. And instead we're going to have to, uh, you know, re reconstruct ourselves to uh, cut emissions. Okay. And the temperatures have already gone up. 
And they're going to continue to go up based on what we're doing now for the next 10 or 20 years. You know, that horse is already out of the barn, okay? And uh, so, sure, we can do that, but realistically, uh, is there any political will to do it? If, and how do you create political will? And is it certainly not too late but to do it, but too late to stop what's already in place? And we're going to have our hands full just dealing with what we've already created. You know, we've made this bed and now we have to sleep in it, so to speak. And yeah, we can change it, but it's not, it's like an aircraft carrier. You know, it takes a miles to turn that thing. And, and uh, I don't know, I don't want to be too pessimistic, pessimistic here, but uh, do, do I answer your question? Yeah, you do. Okay. Go on if you have something more to say about being pessimistic. And Well, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, It's, it's going to take some kind of like a um, clean sheet of paper thinking about where do we want to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and how do we get there? And then we have to just do it. Now, we know that we can cut emissions 50% with conservation, but we're not willing to do that. Well, how bad does it have to get before we're willing to do that? I don't know. But I think this is one of those things that doesn't change until it's bad enough for the political will to shift violently. And it's it's going to be uh, pretty ugly, I think, the whole process. I mean, I'm, not, I'm certainly not looking forward to it. It's, it's one of those, uh, you know, very, diff very difficult things that we're going to be, that we're already facing, and it's only going to get worse. Yeah, yeah I absolutely agree with you. I mean, As an academic, to talk about this in theory is one thing, but of course, in terms of the politics of it, um, it's it's um, pretty pretty bad because what you are basically telling people is that we have to remove some resources from the economy, and that of course means we have to talk about distribution. I would say, okay, so so who's gonna who's gonna get rid of of some of the resources? So who will have less consumption? Um, and I've just seen that in China, for example, they have an electric car which sells very very well. And I think it costs 4,000 euros. It's, it's really small, <laughs> uh, yeah. almost single seat. And trying to sell this to, to like people in the European Union, that this is their, their new kind of electric mobility on average, um, it's going to be hard sell. But I think everything else is just not very realistic. We, we cannot have large electric cars, all of us. Um, sure. Because we will not have But, the renewable energy. Yet. But let's say we switch to electric cars tomorrow. How much of a dent would that make in... CO2 emissions, lower them 3% or something like that. <laughs> We're talking about we have to lower them 100%. It, you know, and that's going to take 10 years. And of course, as long as they're still plugged into the grid and we're still burning coal, natural gas, and all these other things, which is going to go on for a very long time because nobody's willing to cut down on their electricity consumption. Okay, no one's willing to cut down on their energy consumption. It's just not happening. And there's there are certainly ways to do it, but uh, I just don't see it happening. I don't see it at the personal level happening when I talk to individuals with their lifestyles, and I don't see it at the local government level, and I don't see it at the uh, federal government level. Yeah, no, I agree. It's I, I think it's ultimately a thing of enlightenment. You have to teach the people what's going on and make them understand what's going on. I think in Germany we have now a new book on the market which is called The Best Thing is to Do Nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To understand, you just with your time, you just I don't know, hang out with your friends, um, play some basketball, or uh, spend some time with the family, something where you don't use up resources, and that will do it. Um, but that, of course, means that we will have to have a different kind of lifestyle, and of course, many people are afraid that this will be forced upon us, um, and that, of course, is is creating a lot of political backlog. But uh, yeah. But let's, let's move on uh, to the macroeconomic sphere again. So the conference topic is economic policy in the post-pandemic world. In the US, we have already seen significant change. The Fed model stays away, even though inflation rates are very high. Um, or as you said, the, the price level now is growing a little bit faster after growing a little bit more slowly. Um, so letting government spending increase um, and there's no reaction to high rates of inflation uh, by raising rates uh, at the Fed. So do you think that this is already a permanent policy change or do you think this will be revised sooner or later? I think it's already reversing 
we're, we already can't pass an infrastructure bill of three and a half trillion over 10 years, you know, 350 billion a year. Uh, that doesn't even cover depreciation on the infrastructure. You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't put a dent in it and it's not going to happen. It may wind up being half of that and it's further delayed and, uh, you know, time means more depreciation. And so we're, we're getting further behind, you know, while we're waiting to uh, get this bill in place that will we'll still get further behind, but at a slower rate. So uh, again, you know, when you had a pandemic and when you had uh, panic really of uh, a healthcare panic, uh, they're quick to uh, recognize that the government checks aren't gonna bounce, they can do whatever they want. But as, as soon as that passes uh, and it's back to things like repairing your infrastructure or uh, in the U.S., you know, our, our medical system, they put on the brakes. And I think it's because of the polls they're taking with the voters. We have politicians that run by uh, poll. They, they see what the voters are doing, are interested in or not interested in, and then they reflect that no matter how ridiculous they think it is. And you see American politicians making some, what appear to be absolutely ridiculous statements and taking absolutely ridiculous positions. And then you see they've got, you know, 52% support in their district from that position, 65% support. And that's where they're getting these, that's why they're doing it and where they're getting it. it it's completely shameless. Yeah. Well, thank you, Warren. Yeah. Um, before I pass on to Patricia, we will handle the Q and A on this with with getting you questions from the audience. Audience, <clears throat> I am sorry. <clears throat> I got a sore throat or something. Um, I, I forgot to mention uh, Jonas Platner, who is an intern with uh, our NGO and who also helped a lot with organizing this conference. So let me just say this at the very end. And now it's over to you, Patricia. I hope that you have some questions for for Warren. Hi. Um, yes, I do. There has been uh, quite a few questions, actually, mostly about um, uh, political to some extent. So um, I'm going to begin by asking two questions that I think are highly correlated. And um, I apologize in advance to audience members if I completely destroy your names. But um, so the first one is by um, uh, from Jutz uh, Gundert, and he asks, what is the reason that governments refuse to openly acknowledge that MMT is a cor correct description of how money and currency works in a sovereign country? And the next one is by Graham Bachurewicz, um, and he asks, how can we encourage politicians to learn about MMT and drop the fallacies on the deficit? Well, so your first question is why they don't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, well, I, I take that personally. You know, they don't want to give me the satisfaction <laughs> of having been right for 30 years. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, and, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that's what we've been up against for a long time. And the people. I talk to are mostly followers and not leaders, and they don't want to say anything that will marginalize themselves with their voters or open them, make themselves subject to losing the next election, you know, because you know, in a prime, you know, either from their own party in a primary or losing to the opposition. So, uh, and there's been framing of MMT as being part of the radical left, okay, uh, just because that's the people doing that were successful in doing that, not that it hasn't been uh, something understood by the right probably longer than the left. And uh, it's, it's just a, a reluctance to associate. And what was the next question? Uh, how can we encourage politicians to learn about MMT and drop the fallacies? Well, they're, they're going to, it's, they need to see it coming from the voters. And what's interesting about the MMT movement is this has all been a grassroots movement. Now there've been, a, and it's been for 30 years, it was just me and then it was two or three people and then it was eight or 10 and then 15 and then 20, you know, it just grew kind of geometrically, but from nothing until today, there are probably millions. Uh, and not one 
is a public figure or a celebrity. Recently, we had John John Yarmouth, who nobody's ever heard of before this, and he was represented from Kentucky. And so we're all very glad to see we've got somebody with a little bit of celebrity. Uh, and the first one of us to gain any uh, semblance of celebrity status is Stephanie Kelton, Professor Stephanie Kelton. I absolutely congratulate her on that. And, you know, that's critical uh, in this society to get things out there is to uh, get the people who have celebrity status doing it. But in the meantime, I don't think there's ever been a grassroots movement to try and educate the leadership on on how monetary accounting and reserve accounting works. <laughs> you know, you've had you've had grassroots movements for all kinds of you know civil rights or uh, you know freedom and things like that. But to uh, explain debits and credits at the central bank, you know, as a grassroots movement, I, I don't think that's ever happened. But it's been. Uh, it's become an imperative at the grassroots level for people to get this across because they're recognizing the, you know, what's caused things to be the way they are. And, and it's something that say, look, if I can understand this, anybody can understand it. And it's, it's been growing and no, nobody ever goes backwards. Once you understand the government isn't going to run out of money, you don't change your mind in three years and say, Oh, you know, I was wrong. It, it can run out of money. Never mind. Okay. It doesn't happen. It's kind of like a fish hook, you know, once you've got it in it, can't get it out. And so it's just been inch by inch, slowly growing and expanding and hopefully gotten to the level where it's breaking through into the uh, opinion leaders and to enough of an extent where it, it will take over because it's, there's no actual dispute to anything that's, you know, uh, any, any of the MMT analysis. There might be questions of which policy you want to prefer, but not to the fundamental analysis. So I don't, I think we're, it's just taken a while and, and we're very close. I think this kind of conference shows how close we are. Right. So we have a, a technical question from Tim Deutschmann. Uh, yeah. He asks, um, uh, with regards to inflation in a nominal interest rate monetary territory, we should talk about the relationship between borrowing costs being incorporated into consumer prices and the level of inflation. I expect that a full reserve system, negative interest rates on deposits and loan lead to negative inflation. So to, to just to paraphrase, I guess, uh, his comments, I believe what he's asking is, how does the interest rate impact on consumer prices and are negative interest rates deflationary? Uh, yes, I agree with him. I think he's got it absolutely right. The way I say it, is they've got the interest rate thing backwards, of course. And, uh, you know, positive rates, the government's a net payer of interest to the economy, positive rates are a subsidy, negative rates are a tax. You know, uh, they're talking, the Fed's, they're trying to urge the Fed to go to negative rates to help stimulate the economy. Negative rates means if you put $100 in the bank, negative 1%, a year later you have $99. Elizabeth Warren wants to put a wealth tax on, where uh, if you have $100 in the bank a year later, if the tax is 1%, you have $99. It's exactly the same thing. But the wealth tax is, is a tax that slows things down. Negative interest rates is supposedly a stimulus that speeds things up. Well, it can't have it both ways. You know, fundament, functionally, it's the same thing, and it's a tax. So you have the spectrum rate increases or uh, add uh, to, to the public debt. They add deficit their government spending. and uh, that adds to aggregate demand and, you know, output and employment, not the way I would do it, paying interest to people who already have money. You can't have a more regressive way of supporting the economy. I'd much rather, you know, there are a thousand progressive ways to do it that are much better than that, but it, it, it does what it does. A negative rate is a tax, excuse me, it slows things down. Not a lot because people who, uh, uh, who are losing the money have a, probably have a fairly low propensity to spend, but it's not zero. It's still s substantial and uh, it slows things down. So uh, yes, I completely agree with that. And I think that is the one remaining obstacle. And to answer to your last, it adds some, shed some light on your last question as to why they're tending to tighten up. It's because they've seen prices going up and the fear is that the Fed will raise rates to fight inflation. We've also already seen some central banks move in that direction. 
And the Fed's already talking about uh, tapering, not that that does anything, but it, it's the move in that direction of raising rates. And so they put this fear into the political process that says, sure, go ahead and spend. But if you raise rate, if you if this inflation doesn't come down, what they call inflation doesn't come down, Fed's going to raise rates and the Fed agrees. And so you better not do that. OK, so it's hold it's they're being held hostage to rate increases. And it's kind of the way the Bundesbank used to work back in the old days under the mark, where they'd say, yeah, if you don't settle, you know, if you give those unions that pay that that amount of a pay increase, we're going to raise rates. OK, so it was a way to uh, have the central banks control fiscal policy and the and the European Central Bank, of course, is in control of fiscal policy through a different channel, through the credit channel. But uh, in, in the U.S., we're seeing the beginnings of the central bank influencing fiscal policy by threatening rate increases if Congress does anything to cause inflation. Once we understand that they've got it backwards, that raising rates will only make it worse, it's throwing gasoline on the fire, not water on the fire, then that discussion is off the table. Then it becomes nonsense. And then Congress is not constrained by that particular fear. They'll know that if they do create some inflation, fine, but they don't have to worry about the Fed raising rates because that's only going to make it worse. So I think it's you know, imperative that we get this knowledge out there that uh, they do have the interest rate thing backwards and, you know, to keep these politicians from being held hostage uh, by the central banks. Thank you. Um, so, Sashi Sivrams Kishna <laughs> asks, in your opinion, what would be some of the areas in which more research on MMT needs to be done? Or is it just primarily about making people and politicians more aware of its fundamental propositions? Okay, so, you know, more recently, I've gotten a little bit uh, deeper, a little uh, articulating the whole inflation thing differently. And what what we have are two different things. And, and, and these things need some actual research. And of course, the price level is a function of prices paid by government. And I, I won't go into why. Uh, and at price level, um, you know, the markets can only determine relative value. They can't determine absolute value. The only information they get about absolute value comes from the government through the prices it pays. And so the price level is where it is because of the prices the government pays. And we've got three models that demonstrate this very clearly, the UMKC, Buckaroo, the Denison Dollar, and the Franklin Frank, where uh, you know, one hour, it takes one hour. The buckaroo is worth one hour of student labor because that's what you have to do to earn it. And it stayed there for 25 years. There's been no inflation. Okay. The only way it would be worth less than that is if the school started paying more than one buckaroo per hour. If it paid two per hour, then it would be worth half as much. And so we've had a uh, internally stable currency in all three universities for, you know, a long, very long time to demonstrate this. So we know we're not going to get any change in the price level uh, unless the government changes the prices it pays. We can get changes in relative value. We do get changes in relative value, and they happen all the time. But that's not uh, that's a different matter. OK, and so the next thing I do is I say, so the only way you can get inflation, which is a continuous change in the price level, is if, the, you know, uh, under that loose definition, let's call it, is if the um, government decided to continuously pay more and more every year, which is what indexation is roughly about. And all the great Latin American inflations were traced to index indexation by an economist named Prebish, you know, a long time ago. So that's fairly well established in the research. Okay, but if we look more closely at the academic definition of inflation, which is a continuous increase in prices, what does that actually mean? Because in the present, nothing's happening. Prices aren't, they just are where they are. Uh, you know, the central bank can't tell you what the rate of inflation is instantaneously. They can tell you last month that the CPI changed by a certain amount, or they can forecast what it might change by next, but they can't tell you, like, what's the instantaneous rate. They have no way, no way of measuring it, no idea. Uh, so what what is the rate of inflation? So if you look the way I read the academic definition is it's a continuous increase in prices faced by today's agents as they make their day to day decisions in business and in their personal lives, which means it's the term structure of prices, which means uh, if you're 
uh, a jeweler and you need to buy gold. What's important to you is how much gold costs in the spot market, but also how much it costs in the forward market because you have to buy your gold uh, to build your products for next your jewelry for next year and the year after. And the difference between spot prices and forward prices, of course, are a function uh, almost entirely of the uh, interest rate, particularly the policy rate. Okay, and if you're a home builder and somebody buys a house and it's gonna be ready in a year, part of that cost is your cost of carry for a year, which is uh, the interest rate. You're gonna to have to buy materials. You're gonna need capital. You have to pay interest on that. You're gonna to have to borrow to, to finance it. You're gonna to have to pay interest on that. The suppliers are gonna be selling you things that you're gonna order now for six months from now. They have inventory, they have to pay interest. Now cost to carry on that at the interest rate. And so right now, when you're making your decisions on what to buy and sell, whether to invest or not, you've got to have some idea what you think, where you could lock in the price now, you will sell, you will get for your product if you uh, build it now. So the simplest example is if you're going to open up a gold mine and you're going to have gold coming ingots ready in two or three years, you want to hedge that by selling now so you know you can cover your costs. Uh, you look to these forward markets now, and you're facing a term structure of prices. So to, for me, the academic definition of inflation is the uh, a continuous change in the term structure of prices faced by today's agents. That is very different than what the price level may or may not do over time. So it's so the inflation is about the prices you're faced today if you go to buy or sell for delivery in the future. And uh, that's a direct function of the policy rate. So the central bank, when they raise rates, for example, is causing that term structure to uh, reflect those rates and it's causing inflation at, let's say, the, approximately the policy rate. So if the policy rate zero, the term structure of prices is relatively flat and the inflation faced by rate faced by today's agents, the term structure of prices is relatively flat out to term. And uh, if the central bank raises that to 10 percent, now the term structure of prices is going to increase continuously at 10% if let's say the 10 year policy rate is 10%. So, um, and that will and be reflected out to t prices up to 10 years. And so the central bank, when they raise rates are directly uh, setting the term structure of prices for the economy. It, they haven't spent 10 cents looking into what effect that has on the economy. Okay, they've looked at what effect they might have on aggregate demand that might change the price level, but they haven't looked at what they're doing to the term structure of prices that's influencing today's behavior of all the market participants, because most of us are buying things for forward delivery, whether we know it or not, things that aren't delivered for till some for future period of time. And they're, so they're, the policy rate is the inflation rate as defined by the term structure of prices. Uh, and so when you ask them if research could be done, yeah, the Fed has 500 PhDs. Let them figure out what the effects of their changing rates is on, on the economy via this channel of the term structure of prices. They, have, they haven't done that. OK, and in terms of what's affecting the price level, well, we know they know it's affecting relative prices. That's supply and demand. That's the market does that through the institutional structure, which is, of course, highly biased and has all kinds of rigidities in it, but that's another story. And uh, they know it's prices paid by the government. So there's not, you know, once you understand that, there's not the kind of work to do that they're doing. Okay, there's a different kind of work to do. So that's the uh, the long answer on what kinds of research could be done uh, at, you know, right now that would be extremely valuable to, uh, to us as, uh, you know, we're working with the economy. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, if a government that is well known for fiscal prudence start following MMT style policies, won't their currency get hammered on the currency markets? Okay, so <laughs> it, you have to tell me what following MMT style policies means. <laughs> uh, you know, look, if you, if you uh, spend money to build the Panama Canal, then you've lowered costs, you've improved trade, you, you've created a deflationary bias, you're increasing your real standard of living and your real consumption. And uh, those types of things tend to make your currency real uh, more valuable. It's a deflationary bias. All, all you can say about currency values that we 
know pretty much as a fact is longer term, it's purchasing power parity. Yeah, short term, it's things that, have, uh, medium term, maybe things that affect inflation, and then short term would be um, anticipating what may or may not cause any of these things to happen. But oh, uh, ju um, just to add to that, they, they just clarify the question. They mean specifically on the ignoring the deficit issue. That yeah. I don't think, so yeah. If, if you spend deficit spend to build the Panama Canal and lower costs, mm -hmm. you, you know, you impart a deflationary bias, you've been proved your real terms of trade, that would have a positive impact on your currency. If after that you spend the same money on blowing up the Panama Canal, you've created a highly inflationary event and that will cause your currency to go down. So, it, you know, it depends on how you're spending the money. Is it being spent to uh, increase productivity and reduce prices or is it being squandered on, you know, building bombs and blowing them up, which is just purely, you know, demand side, uh, you're increasing the demand side with the spending, but you're not getting anything on the supply side. So, uh, it, you know, I, I have to say it, it depends, right? And uh, I mean, uh, I'd like to expand on that question and maybe ask whether, you know, yeah, look, Japan, Japan's got 200% debt to GDP, right? Mm -hmm. And they have no inflation, you know, for 30 years, zero rates and uh, QE, much higher than anybody can imagine, which we know is a placebo, but I mean, MMT knows it's a placebo. And then you look at Turkey with a 35% debt to GDP and 15 or 20% inflation with a 15 or 20% interest rate. And so how much of it, you know, I've seen a lot of inflations over the years, but I i don't know that I can remember one that was caused by excess demand. They're usually caused by something else. It's possible in theory to, to go out there and just drive up prices, uh, with deficit spending by doing enough of it, but I don't know that anybody's ever actually done it. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the on the subject specifically of exchange rates, um, yeah. you know, you can you can also not have any policy changes, and because of uh, a speculation, you can experience massive shifts in exchange rates. Uh, to, to what extent is you know a country vulnerable to that, and what can it yeah. do about it? Well, we've seen the dollar. The, the yen had a 50% move when it went from um, 80 to 120 not too long ago. And we've seen the dollar have 50% moves. The euro had a 50% move a few years ago when uh, everyone panicked at, at Draghi's uh, you know, do what it takes. And uh, it, hard, it hardly made the, the news. Okay, so the, these currencies are moving around all the time. We've seen the Australian dollar go from on almost 110 to maybe 60, right? Almost fall in half. And Australia is still there and it hasn't been that big of a deal. So can currencies fluctuate and currencies move? Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, why do you care? All right. And so uh, you have to come up with a reason why you care. What's the negative effect that you're worried about? So let's look at uh, just one thing, which is the real wealth of the nation in your your real consumption and i'll make the point that um, the currencies don't have anything to do with that so and and that's the most i think the most important thing from a from a real economic standpoint so your real wealth is your pile of stuff which is everything you can produce domestically adds to your pile okay which means you want to be at full employment so you can maximize your pile of stuff because that's your real wealth your real output okay Everything you import adds to that pile, makes it larger, and everything you export makes it smaller. And your imports, which make it larger, minus your exports, those are your real terms of trade because you want to make your pile as large as possible. So, so your domestic output is not going to change, doesn't need to change because of your exchange rate. You could be the only country in the world not even have an exchange rate. Your domestic output still is what it is. It's what you can produce with everybody working. And of course, we know that we can always sustain full employment. All you need is a floating exchange rate and political will to do it. And so uh, the question then is, what about your real terms of trade? And the, the answer to that is the exports exchange for imports at world prices. And I can give you a couple of examples. You, you know, you dig up uh, gold in South Africa and uh, you go to Europe with a one ounce gold coin and you go to London and maybe that 
is worth a certain amount of pounds, which happens to be uh, enough to buy a men's suit. And I think somebody did a chart once that showed that an ounce of gold has been worth a men's suit, man's suit for a long time. I'll, I'll just use that as an example. Okay, so you go to London and you exchange that piece of gold for a, a new suit. Okay, the guy who does that exchange doesn't really care, that has no doesn't care at all what the level of the rand is or what the unemployment rate is or anything about South Africa. The piece of gold exchanges for a man's, a man's suit, and that's, and that's it, okay? And, and so that doesn't change, okay, with your, if, your, if the rand changes, if the rand goes down or the rand goes up, that doesn't change. What does change, and it's very critical and needs, you know, continuous attention, I'm not downplaying it at all, is who has to dig go dig up the gold and who gets to wear the suit. Okay, that's what changes. And uh, I remember in Australia, I was in Newcastle and they have all these ships with coal, full of coal lined up there, these coal boats leaving Australia. And they would go to Hong Kong and they go uh, ship coal to Hong Kong and then they bring in television sets or whatever they get from Hong Kong. And uh, the people in Hong Kong, they exchange gold, you know, coal for television sets. Doesn't They don't care about the Australian dollar, whether it's up or down. Okay, and, and so Australia's terms of trade are how much coal they have to ship out versus how many um, television sets they get back for that coal. And that, those are their real terms of trade. And what the level of the Australian dollar does is, you know, determines who has to go dig for coal and who gets to watch television sets. It's an entirely a distributional issue within your own economy. And, and all your fiscal policies, all monetary policies, those are all distributional. Those are those are what determine who has to dig the coal and who gets to watch the television sets, who has to dig the gold and who gets to wear the suit. That's all determined by your internal fiscal policies. You know, deal with your uh, taxation and who gets taxed and who doesn't and who gets what and all your institutional structure about uh, which gets translated through markets and relative value into who gets what. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that too long of an answer? No, no. I think I think it's just right. And uh, the next question is going back to the pandemic and yeah. asking. Um, we've had well, we, we, we've had a, a quite a lot of economic support for the pandemic, and in the UK we've had furloughed. In the US they've had checks. Um, the question is: Do you think there could be an economic shock from the uh, the deficit shrinking as a result of the COVID support support being revoked? Yes. And there's an additional reason nobody's talking about, and that is your your savings, you know, your net financial assets that people have that are in your pension funds. Those are determined by your savings desire is determined by your real needs. So if you've got uh, cash in your cash register as a merchant and all the prices suddenly double, you need twice as much cash. If you walk around with, you know, uh, hundred dollars in your pocket because that's kind of what you need to go grocery shopping and that type of thing. If prices double, you need to walk around with two hundred dollars in your pocket. If you're Apple with two hundred billion dollars in cash or two hundred fifty billion and prices double, the cost of all your employees double and you need to have five hundred billion to cover what you think are your short term and medium term liquidity, possible liquidity liquidity needs. So our we think of our savings, we gauge the amount of nominal wealth we need by what it can buy in real terms. And so when we see a 5% increase in prices and face a 5% increase, suddenly our savings that we're carrying around and that we're using as working capital and that we're keeping in our pension fund has just dropped by 5% in terms of what it can buy. And now we're short. And so now we need more unspent income, which is a demand leakage you know, drain, which needs to be offset by somebody's deficit spending. So when prices are going up, faster than uh, the, the deficit, let's say as a percentage of GDP, the real savings is shrinking. The real public debt adjusted for inflation is actually going down. And that creates a drag on the economy, you know, whether you like it or not. And if you look at 1979, you can attribute that major recession we had to the fact that, yes, we were wanting what looked like high deficits, you know, five, six, seven percent of GDP, but we had price increases of 10 percent or more. We actually uh, the public debt was actually being reduced in real terms, even though it was growing in nominal terms. 
and it was growing at a reduced rate. I mean, the growth, growth rate was slowing, but it, it, so we went into surplus in real terms. So the, the price increases can cause you to go into surplus in real terms, even though you're still in deficit in nominal terms. And that happened in 2006, you know, 2007, the deficit got down to 1% of GDP in nominal terms of prices were going up faster than that. We actually had a fiscal contraction, you know, a surplus in real terms uh, from that policy. And so the answer is yes, it's a very real uh, uh, concern and it happens all the time and nobody even notices it. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I have a question on uh, Japan, and Japan has always, uh, well, has always been perceived as the poster child for MMT, even though, um, you know, throughout all these decades, and and even though I'm pretty sure that its politicians ne didn't necessarily know MMT by name, why is Japan such a special case what, that worth following? Well, I, you know, so their high debts have always the high public debt to GDP ratio, the public debt. You know, I, I was talk, I've been talking about this for 30 years at the, um, about it and met with a lot of economists and they're all saying, well, Japan, you know, the U.S. can't do that. Japan's a special case because they're, uh, it's all held domestically or some nonsense like that. And, and now it's becoming more and more obvious that that's not the reason that they're not a special case in that sense. And uh, that the dynamics that affect their economy are the same dynamics that affect ours and Europe's. And so uh, and so it's become special in that sense, in the sense you spoke of, where it had always been considered special in the sense I just spoke of. So now it's like a, it's becoming an educational <laughs> tool where before it was sloughed off as an educational tool because it's different. You know, Japan's a different society. It's a special case. And every time something differed from mainstream, it was a special case. And pretty soon everybody was a special case and nobody was a general case. And so now everything's been reset and Japan's not so much a special case anymore, but it is has 30 years of education for us that shows zero rate policy is not inflationary. If anything, it's deflationary. Quantitative easing is a placebo and nothing more. Yes, the central bank can set the entire yield curve readily with no uh, you know, uh, effects on output and employment from that policy, other than the effect of the interest rate, which is the deflationary effect of the zero rates. And uh, yes, you can have a high debt to GDP ratio, which they've tried to bring down, you know, many times with increasing the sales tax. And every time they did, they just had a major economic setback. And they're probably discussing doing it again. I don't know. Uh, next, next time it comes around. So, uh, and, and so now that we've had 10 years of similar policies in Europe and the U.S., and we're seeing kind of a convergence, I think they're recognizing that maybe it's the policies uh, that are causing the events everywhere in Japan. They don't, it isn't like different where they can do something that like zero rates where we can't, that type of thing. Right. Um, so... I mean, the, the economists have been predicting that Japan was, you know, the, the, the sky was going to fall in at any minute yeah. now. And, uh, and yeah. they've been saying the same with, um, I guess, the COVID support in, in Europe and elsewhere, um, uh, particularly on the crowding out element. They think that yeah. eventually, well, you're, you know, um, government spending is just going to push interest rates up and then that's yeah. going to crowd out private sector investment yeah. and, and will be ruined. Um, so what would you say to that? Is crowding out well, a real yeah, thing? Applies, yes, it's a real thing, but it applies to a fixed exchange rate policy. It doesn't apply mm -hmm. to floating exchange rates. It's interesting, you know, on this public debts, this ticking time bomb and everything else. I was, I was with Charles Goodhart once from the Bank of England in a discussion, and there were some people from Japan, and, and, and they were talking about public debt. And, and Charles said, well, yes, he said, you know, they've been telling us that for 300 years now. <laughs> so... Uh, now we've been hearing it for 30 years in Japan. And I think a year ago, you know, I, you know, I've been on record you're writing about it for a long time that the, the zero rates are not going to cause any kind of an economic recovery. It's the other way around. They're going to be deflationary and uh, uh, be a deflationary bias. And um, it was only last year, after almost 30 years, someone from the Bank of Japan was asked about that. And they said, well, we just need a little more time. 
Okay. And uh, I remember Mario Draghi after seven or eight years was asked, and it was, we just need a little more time. And Janet Yellen said the same thing, you know, well, we just need a little more time. You know, I guess you can always say that, but uh, Charles was there. It's, it's been 300 years now. You know, at some point, maybe they come around and realize it's not just about needing a little more time. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so there aren't any more questions that I can see at the moment, but okay. I have a, a, a slightly more on the personal side question and something that um, I've always been curious about. Um, what, so, what's my favorite color? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you've you <laughs> discovered the MMT insights insights that mmt is founded on you you discovered while working uh, in a bank and as a as a as a fund manager and um i've i've whenever i've spoken to traders or people who work in it as investors um they seem to be much more aware of how things work than economists but they also be, seem to be quite protective of that knowledge and they yes. want to be ahead of the pack you know yes what drove you to you know, disseminate this information as opposed to just simply keeping it to yourself and make a nice profit from it. So I had the advantage of uh, that they didn't, which was nobody ever copied or, or thought my trades would work. So I was a fund manager. I wasn't at a bank, just had my own fund. I, I had started in a bank before that, but then I went to Bankers Trust and then William Blair, and then I started my own fund in 1982. And it was a fixed income arbitrage fund. And I would put these positions on and long this and short that, which in my mind, I saw them clearly as convergence trades where they couldn't lose money and would make a certain amount. And nobody else did. I shouldn't say nobody else, but for all practical purposes, only, only one or two of our clients did who became our clients and no, nobody else did. And I'd explain it to them and they'd argue with me and tell me why I was wrong. And what you don't understand is, you know, is something I've heard more than anything in the last <laughs> 50 years. Well, what you don't understand is Australia is a small open economy. Well, what you don't understand is. So anyway, um, and for 15, you know, for let's say for the first 14 years, you know, or for 15 years before I turned it over to my partners at the end of 97, you know, we didn't have a single losing trade. Every trade wound up working out. And uh, even after 14 years, I'd come up with some Thing that I thought was an anomaly in the markets that we, and after 14 years of trades that always worked out, the, the dealers and these are Goldman Sachs and Solomon Brothers and all, all the other J.P. Morgan that we I dealt with. I only dealt with wholesale accounts. I never, I only made money uh, you know, buying and selling from those people, not from individuals or anything like that. Uh, they would I'd show them what I was doing, and they say, "Well, no, we don't." We don't think that's going to work, and here's why, and here, here's what you don't understand. <laughs> and, and it happened right up until the end. And then uh, when I was making cars, I, I built the first consoleers that had the frame on the outside like an egg. So all the painted surface was stressed and not the inside. So there was and it was a composite uh, surface like you'd have in a boat. It wasn't, it wasn't new technology in terms of materials or anything. And the car, instead of weighing 3,200 pounds, weighed 2,000 pounds. So it outran everything. It got 30 miles to the gallon and built them for a number of years. And Corvette, actually, General Motors bought one and brought it back and looked at it and, you know, certainly liked it and, and patterned a couple of things in their car after it. But nobody ever copied that basic structure, and they still haven't, that, you know, enables automobiles to be built a thousand, two thousand pounds lighter than they're building them now. And so I I'd never, I was always full disclosure for my whole 15 years as a fund manager. I always disclosed every position I had. I didn't keep anything secret because I, I was insecure. I was, I wanted people to look at it and tell me what was wrong with it because I didn't want to make a mistake for my investors. We'd have credit people come down from maybe JP Morgan to give us a line of credit. And they'd say, look, you don't have to worry when you show us your positions, because we won't show them to the traders you know, who might take advantage of you. I said, no, please do. Show them to the traders. And if they find something wrong with it, don't lend me the money. Let me know, because I don't, I don't want to do something where I'm losing money. So uh, I always ran a full disclosure. And I don't know that anybody else ever did in that industry. And so, yes, they keep everything very close. They don't disclose to anybody what they're doing. Uh, 
I, I just never had that issue and I was always the opposite. And this was just a continuation of that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, Mark Epstein is actually <laughs> asking uh, a little bit further on that saying, uh, can you trace this tendency to think originally back to your childhood? Can you remember any signs of this style of thinking when you were very young? <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I, you know, I have to think about it and get back to you. <laughs> Bill Armstrong called me, Professor Armstrong. He's asked me if he could do a biography, and I said, "Sure." You know, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to do a biography, so he said, "Okay." So he started doing it, and I've I've given him names of people, a couple of them from my childhood to interview. He's come up with some interesting things here that I hadn't remembered that they had remembered, and. Uh, so I look forward to seeing more of that, but I, you know, I'm, I'm sure there were, <laughs> I just don't know. I, I just can't remember what, what, what they were. Right. Uh, and then another question um, from Mike Hall is, um, what do you think um, Stephanie Kelton uh, of what Ste Stephanie Kelton is doing in the U S um, uh, she's just released a Ted talk as well. Do you think that's going to be quite significant for the MMT movement? Yeah, oh, sure. She's been over 500,000 views. And uh, so, you know, everybody I talk to I, that I meet in the street, oh, have you ever heard of Stephanie Kelton? And, and so far, they haven't. So we need to keep moving until everybody goes, oh, of course. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and that will be, you know, our breakthrough. She's our, uh, you know, celebrity now that's reached, gotten some semblance of celebrity status that, uh, you know, is, you know, what it takes. Like I said before, you know, this has all evolved without just from the grassroots up from really just regular people who are uninvolved in finance, who understood it, you know, recognized the damage it was doing. And just as a matter of conscience are, are out there working to, to spread the word. And it's been growing that way. And uh, that that's a long, hard pains, you know, painful way to grow. And we've been doing that and successfully, maybe the only you know, movement of this type and that I've ever heard of that's, that's been promoted this way. And, uh, but as soon as we get the celebrities on top, then, then it just, uh, passes the tipping point and, uh, moves on. So yeah, I, I do everything I can to support Stephanie and, you know, anybody else who's, uh, you know, looking to, uh, promote modern monetary theory. Right. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, so I'll just ask um, a question made by Stuart Medina, who's asking, um, why do you think uh, the current increase in the prices of raw materials is coming from? Um, and if we should be worried about inflation because of them or they're temporary? Right. So uh, a lot of it's coming from the tariffs that Trump started and Biden doubled down on, of course. And they've been disruptive. Supply chains have been disrupted. And then you throw into that all the disruptions from COVID, multiplied it by 10 or whatever. And uh, and it's just uh, you get pile ups at shipping terminals and suddenly shipping costs are higher and that type of thing. You've got um, all these adjustments that are coming through on the cost side. Uh, and that's, that's what we're sitting with right now. So they don't have to go back to where they were to have inflation go to zero. They just have to stay where they are. And then inflation will be at zero and we will have had a one-time adjustment and we will all be, you know, real terms of trade will be worse off and uh, real output will be lower. So if um, for real output to be sustained, this one-time adjustment will have to be met with uh, either the prices will have to come back, which some have. You look at lumber prices, they've come back, you know, two thirds of the way back down and some of these other uh, sensitive prices. Uh, and we have to be, you know, hope that the uh, oil cartel, the Saudis don't continuously raise prices like they did in 2007 and 2008, up to, you know, double the price of oil. If that happens, you know, all bets are off. And, uh, but if, if the price of energy stays about where it is and the supply chains will slowly come back, they won't be quite as favorable as where they were. 
but the price increase will turn out to have been one time and not continuous. And the our present institutional structure seems to have us stuck with about a 2% rate of CPI change, okay, if you want to call that inflation, you know, over time. And we'll, we'll gravitate back towards that level. Uh, I don't see it, um, any forces right now causing this to run away mm. into 10, 12, 20, 25% type rates of inflation. That's not how it happens. And it's all, of course, you don't get any any of it unless the government pays the higher prices. But our, with our institutional structure, government does pay the higher prices. When the price of fuel goes up, they buy whatever the military needs at the higher prices. The post office pays the price. You know, they're completely insensitive to price. So uh, with the government in there ratifying the higher prices, you're unlikely to get rollbacks, but you can get restabilization at the higher prices. And then uh, from there, inflation just levels off. Right. So that's, uh, I guess, another incentive to become less dependent on oil as well. Yeah. Well, the less dependent, or you mean to use less. Even if you're producing mm -hmm. your own, the price is going to be what it's going to be. It's as if there's one big pool of oil in the world. It's not going to be higher one place and lower in another. So um, just being independent, it's not that you just want to not use it. Okay, so I think we'll finish the session there. Thank you very much, Warren, and as well to Dr. Entz for your interesting discussion. And thank you to the audience for the questions that you have sent. They're all very good. And um, sorry, you want to say fi some final words? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at WB Mosler. And if you, you know, message me if you have any more questions or want to discuss anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.